Welcome, I'm Katherine Hadro, and this is EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Supreme Court setback. The high court sides with abortion facilities and reverses Louisiana's pro-life law. Hear from the Louisiana Solicitor General who defended the law at the Supreme Court. Pro-life Democrat, Louisiana State Senator Katrina Jackson wrote the law the Supreme Court reversed. She's here with her reaction. And fostering hope, a new executive order is aimed to help American children in foster care. It's a major disappointment for the pro-life movement. The Supreme Court reverses Louisiana's pro-life law this week in a 5-4 decision, siding with the state's abortion facilities. In the case June Medical Services v. Russo, the Supreme Court ruled that Louisiana's law posed substantial obstacles to women without significant benefits to their safety. The law required abortion facilities maintain the same safety and health standards as all other surgical centers in the state. Justice Stephen Breyer wrote the opinion. He was joined by the other liberal justices and Chief Justice John Roberts, who wrote a concurring opinion. Roberts claimed the Louisiana law was, quote, nearly identical to the Texas law struck down four years ago in Whole Woman's Health. The Catholic justice wrote, I joined the dissent in Whole Woman's Health and continue to believe that the case was wrongly decided. The question today, however, is not whether whole women's health was right or wrong, but whether to adhere to it in deciding the present case. Justice Clarence Thomas, also Catholic, dissented, writing, quote, today a majority of the court perpetuates its ill-founded abortion jurisprudence by enjoining a perfectly legitimate state law and doing so without jurisdiction. As is often the case with legal challenges to abortion regulations, this suit was brought by abortionists and abortion clinics. He continued, our abortion precedents are grievously wrong and should be overruled. Liz Merle is Solicitor General of Louisiana. She defended Louisiana's law at the Supreme Court for this case and joins us now via Skype. Liz, first off, what's your reaction to the high court ruling this week? Well, you know, it was deeply disappointing to see um, the chief side with um, the liberal justices on this issue. And, and I think it's very disappointing for women and so I'm not sure what I can say about that other than we were we were pretty disappointed and um, to see how that came out it's a good law it's a law that protects the health and safety of women and our record was different so it was disappointing to see the chief not recognize that Liz I had the opportunity to be in the Supreme Court for the oral arguments in this case and the plaintiff for the abortion business claimed this Louisiana law was quote identical to the Texas law that had already been struck down. Can you explain why that's not true? And were the justices not able to distinguish the two? Well, I mean, when you have several justices who don't want to distinguish the two, then you, you know, they're just going to find all of the commonalities and ignore the differences. And, and it was a different law and it was it was in a different, entirely different regulatory structure. And I think the most significant difference is that we require all doctors who are medical staff of ambulatory surgery centers to have privileges. We require doctors in office-based surgery um, practices to have admitting privileges if they don't have a residency, but these clinics were being exempt from that requirement. Mm. What did you make of Chief Justice Roberts' concurring opinion? The fact he supported the Texas law in Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstadt, but then ruled against Louisiana's law. You know, I mean, I think that we have to look at the opinion and recognize that what he did, even though he took, even though he voted that our law was unconstitutional and was similar to the Texas law and needed to fall, he actually rewrote Hellerstead. I mean, he's we. That is a significant change from Whole Woman's Health. He interpreted it differently, and he interpreted Whole Woman's Health in the way that we had advocated in our brief. Wow, Liz, how concerning is it to you that it was the abortion business that challenged this law and took it to court, not a woman? Does that raise red flags for you? Absolutely. I mean, we we flagged that issue early on. 
and we still think it is a hugely important issue. I think it's deeply, deeply disappointing to continue to substitute women's voices and override the actual voices of women who testified on behalf of this bill, the bipartisan support that came from the legislature from both men and women, and substitute that for the voices of abortion doctors who have a profit and they have economic interest in the outcome and they have an overriding interest in not being regulated. That is an absolute conflict of interest. Mm. And to that point, can you remind our viewers why this law was necessary in the first place? What was happening at Louisiana abortion facilities? They have a terrible record, health and safety record. The doctors have a poor record of with malpractice complaints and disciplinary referrals. The clinics themselves don't do any credentialing. Uh, we had unrefuted evidence of that. Um, I still find it perplexing that the chief could ignore document after document after document of terrible health and safety conditions and, and recognize that this law would actually provide some protection for women and girls going into those clinics. Mm -hmm. So where does Louisiana go from here? Is this the end of the state requiring basic safety and health standards at abortion facilities? Absolutely not. We will keep fighting. We have laws that are currently on the books now, um, including physician, the physician only laws. We have a new a law that was passed after the admitting privileges law that requires doctors to be uh, licensed, board certified, family practice physicians or OBGYNs. We have a, a number of other regulations um, that were passed after the admitting privileges law that I think help ensure the health and safety of women and girls in these clinics. So we won't stop fighting to protect life. Attorney General Landry has been very committed to this, um, to this fight and we'll keep fighting and we'll keep defending the laws of Louisiana and, um, and life. In the meantime, what does this ruling mean for the safety and well-being of women in the state of Louisiana? Well, I mean, I think this, this ruling puts, puts precedent over people and, and we'll keep fighting um, against that that outcome. But at the end of the day, we're just going to keep defending our laws. And now we're going to keep moving, moving forward. And I think that we'll now take the, the chief concurring um, opinion and we will bring that back to the courts. And it has moved the needle. It's moved it back to the Casey undue burden standard from Hellerstedt. That's that I consider that to be um, a gain rather than a loss. Liz, from a legal perspective, do safety regulations even stand a chance at the high court right now, or will they all be found to be unconstitutional? No, I think they do stand a chance. And I think if you look at the concurring opinion that the Chief Justice wrote, he walked through some, some, of the, uh, some examples from prior cases, specifically from Casey and from Maserick v. Armstrong, physician-only laws, other health and safety regulations that have already been upheld by the court. I, I read that as reaffirming those precedents and reaffirming those health and safety regulations um, and, and saying that they do not create a substantial obstacle. Mm. Liz, for our viewers who may not be familiar with the Louisiana law, can you speak to how it had bipartisan support in the state? It, enormous bipartisan support. I think there were only about eight legislators who voted against it. So it was very, very widely supported. And, and one of the reasons why is because of the deficiency reports here and the testimony of women and doctors in the legislature in support of this bill. It's fascinating. It's fascinating to see um, the pro-life Democrats that are in Louisiana from your governor to State Senator Katrina Jackson, who will be joining us on the show a little bit later. Well, we're, we're going to keep on following this and just see what happens next. But we're so grateful for you joining us. Liz Morrell, Louisiana Solicitor General, thank you. Thanks, Catherine. For a continued pro-life reaction, joining us now via Skype is Marjorie Dannenfelser, the president of the Susan B. Anthony List. Marjorie is also the co-chair of Pro-Life Voices for Trump. Marjorie, welcome back. This ruling is seen as a strategy setback for the pro-life movement. Does the movement need to rethink proposed laws so they can better withstand the Supreme Court? Where do we go from here? Yeah, you know, um, I don't think we shift strategy. I think we keep going. Hmm. Um, there are many laws moving around the country that have uh, been adopted by legislatures all over that are being passed, signed by governors, 
challenged by court and different circuit courts have different opinions. That's when the Supreme Court has to step in and say what it thinks. So on, in two major areas, in the area of non-discrimination abortion laws, meaning you can't abort a baby because of its gender, its sex, or the fact that it has a disability, um, and in the area of mid to late term so a 20 week pain capable bill, mm. when a baby feels excruciating pain from the abortion. Those two bills are passing all over the place under the conditions that I just described. Um, we really think that those two are headed towards the court relatively soon. Um, and I'll, on, on the regulation, clinic regulation piece, our people will never stop. There is no sense that anyone will pull back from trying to just enact basic uh, common sense laws that uh, that a, a clinic should be regulated in the way that any mm -hmm. legitimate medical a facility should be regulated to protect women. But now that the high court has struck down both Texas and Louisiana's law requiring these basic safety and health standards for women at abortion facilities, is this the end for the admitting privilege laws? You know, or will all safety requirements at abortion facilities be seen as unconstitutional? Well, you know, the this court is so unpredictable, especially with a Supreme Court justice deciding one day he thinks it's legit, on another he doesn't because deciding a really recent precedent. Um, I don't believe that it's the end. I think this is a stuttering beginning of what will be better um, better abortion law in the future. And it is really because of the, re, the transformation of the court and, um, and what it will approve in the future. I don't think it's the end. I think we keep going. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and one thing I know, it doesn't matter what any of us say, the legislators across the country that really believe in this, you couldn't stop them if you tried. Mm. Marjorie, many Americans cited the Supreme Court for the reason that they voted for President Trump in 2016. June Medical Services, this case was the first abortion-related case with both of Trump's judicial nominees, Justices Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, on the bench. And while they ruled in favor of Louisiana's pro-life law, the court ultimately still sided with the abortion business. Marjorie, will this week's outcome motivate pro-lifers in 2020, or does it actually reveal the court's limits in the pro-life movement? No, I don't think it reveals limits. It reveals hope and possibility. Uh, by were it not for this one justice that no one could predict, basically our new Kennedy, we would have uh, that would would have been upheld. And the only way that changes is that we with a really newly reengaged, really newly intensified movement because of this decision have the opportunity to elect a president and then more Supreme Court justice that will do the compassionate, the right thing. Every human rights movement that has ever been successful in this country has had a similar path. It's a zigzag, not a straight line. There are setbacks and there are moves forward, but we are in the driver's seat right now. Uh, and that has never been the case in the pro-life. We are so close. It is not a moment to be discouraged, but to lean on the Lord and follow his plan. And that is never to be. Chief Justice Roberts has indicated reluctance to disturb any precedent rulings. Is there any chance to chip away or reverse Roe v. Wade as long as he's on the court? You seem to have hope up, hope there. Oh, without question, there is more to come. There are more opportunities um, with more judges, even he. Um, and there is no time to falter. It's time to move ahead. Without question, we are so close. There's no time to, look, to wait. Marjorie Dannon Felser, president of the Susan B. Anthony List. Thank you. The sanctity of human life is central to the teachings of the Catholic Church. We believe every human life begins at the moment of conception and lasts until natural death. That's a fundamental belief we as Catholics carry with us from inside our church walls to outside in the public square. And now that we are only four months away from election day, we need to make sure we are first and foremost informing our conscience on this issue of life. We should be rereading the catechism, papal encyclicals on life, and even reviewing EWTN's voter's guide. That way, when we get to the November ballot box, we can make a well-informed and prayerful decision. And that brings us to this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com and sign our pledge that you will vote pro-life. By signing this pledge, we can keep each other accountable to prioritize life at the ballot box. Let us all in these next four months take the steps to inform our conscience on life, pray, and discern our decision for our November vote. How crucial it is to have lawmakers and national leaders who respect the dignity of all human life. 
Life is sacred and a fundamental right. Again, as we prepare for Election Day, sign the pledge that you'll vote with life in mind. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com. The pro-life female Democrat who authored the very Louisiana law the Supreme Court overturned says this week's ruling is another example of judicial overreach. Once again, unelected justices have substituted their policy preferences over the clear will of the people of my great state. As long as the Supreme Court continues to meddle in an area that rightfully belongs in the democratic process, women will remain subject to substandard abortion facilities. That is Louisiana State Senator Katrina Jackson, who wrote the state's 2014 Unsafe Abortion Protection Act. That's the law the Supreme Court reversed this week that required abortion facilities have the same safety and health standards as all the other surgical centers in the state. Joining us now via Skype to discuss is Louisiana State Senator Katrina Jackson herself. Welcome back. When you author this Louisiana law, how was it received in your state? Uh, with overwhelming support, not only of the legislators, but of women of the state and the constituency, this bill has actually passed by overwhelming majority of the legislature with both men and women, blacks and whites, um, Republicans, Democrats, and independents being co-authors of this legislation. And tell us why was it important to you to create this law in the first place? Well, it was really an oversight of those who had passed statutes uh, in Louisiana that require surgical centers, uh, ambulatory surgical centers to have um, physicians to have admitting privileges. So what was so important was this, in every other center, a physician must have admitting privileges in the state of Louisiana with the exception of abortion facilities prior to authoring this law. And so basically Louisiana, unbeknownst to the legislators, um, had a lower standard of care for women than it did for men in this area. If a man decides to have a vasectomy tomorrow, every center he goes to in the state of Louisiana, that physician will have to have admitting privileges. And so it was very important, also because of the countless women who had testified about mm -hmm. their experiences when they selected to have an abortion and how when they had complications, basically the center had to call 911. And after that, they were totally disconnected from the physician that performed the procedure and um, they had to go in the, to an emergency room through an, um, emergency transportation and be seen by a physician that had no idea what had just happened to them. Your witness really does defy the main narrative of the pro-abortion lobby. Katrina, can you tell us about why you are a pro-life Democrat? Um, it's based on my faith in God. I was in church one day and I tell this story all the time. I was 20 some years old and uh, we were studying the Bible and, and we got to the Proverbs and it says six things that God hates. Number seven is an abomination. One of those six things that God hates was the shedding of innocent blood. And must, what's more innocent than a life that has known no sin, that has been born into a world of sin? And so I said, if I'm going to do whatever I do in life, I'm going to stand for what God hates. Mm -hmm. To that point, Katrina, ahead of the Supreme Court oral arguments on your Louisiana law, you took part in a vigil on the steps of the Supreme Court and you led a powerful prayer. We've spoken before about your Christian faith and while this week's ruling is deeply demoralizing, where do you, Katrina, see God in all of this? Um, I think that our nation has denied God before. I was very prayerful that they wouldn't deny who God is and what he says about uh, abortion and what he says about taking care of the least of them. And, and so, I am deeply disturbed. I posted a um, on my Facebook and on my Twitter accounts, I posted this picture and I still don't know who this artist is. And it's a picture of, of, of um, the Statue of Liberty holding a child and mourning for that child. And I told them that on the day that the Supreme Court decision came out, I mourned for America, that we were constantly getting away from what God wanted. And so in my Christian faith, I had to dig deep inside to not be as disappointed and to go on advocating. And I, and I remember what the scripture says, that the race is not giving to the strong, nor to the swift, but to those who endure. And so I see us at a point where God is asking us and challenging us to endure during this season while people really are denying God in this nation mm -hmm. and that we still have what should be the light that the world sees to bring them back to him. What does this week's ruling say about the future of the pro-life movement? I mean, should we shift away from a focus on laws and turn more of our attention into engaging culture? What are your thoughts on this? 
Well, I, I don't see when we lose a battle I, I, I like that. I see that we're still attempting to win the war, the war on the killing of the unborn and murder happening in clinics legally. I think that we definitely have to still participate and focus on the law, but we have to be more engaging to the general public. Uh, and that's what Louisiana is doing. I also authored last year a constitutional amendment that's on the ballot in Louisiana for the presidential election, which gives the people for the first time a chance to engage in the process and actually vote on this issue. Uh, we have been in Louisiana with the right to life. Uh, we've been advocating more in the community, going out to our churches, our churches connecting us with youth organizations. So yes, I do think, think we still focus on law. But that missing element that Louisiana has been focused on for the last year is the people mm. and engaging the community and educating the community about this field and others and about why being pro-life is so important. But I've said this before, and what we did was we went back to what I call ground zero. We went back to the church and made sure that our pastors were communicating with their congregation on what abortion meant, that it wasn't a political issue, but it was a it was a Christian issue. It was what you held valuable. And so that's what I think really across this nation, the pro-life movement has to do. Absolutely, and you remind us and you, always that the pro-life issue should be a bipartisan issue as well. So grateful to have you here this week in particular. Katrina Jackson, Louisiana State Senator, thank you. Thank you. Coming up, a prominent Catholic university hires a well-known pro-abortion politician. We speak out on why a recent Notre Dame hire is deeply concerning. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. A top Catholic university hires a prominent pro-abortion politician. That is this week's Speak Out segment. The University of Notre Dame announced last week it will be welcoming former South Bend mayor and 2020 Democratic presidential candidate Pete Buttigieg as a faculty fellow. Buttigieg will be a faculty fellow at the university's Institute for Advanced Study for the coming academic year, where he will work on two research projects, join in academic programming, and teach an undergraduate course. As a Democratic candidate for president, Buttigieg ran on an extreme pro-abortion platform by refusing efforts to place any limits on abortion. And during a town hall, the then Democratic candidate said, there is no room in the Democratic Party for pro-lifers. His political record is not any better. As mayor of South Bend, Indiana, the home of Notre Dame, Buttigieg vetoed a zoning request by a pro-life pregnancy resource center. It's disappointing that a Catholic university would give such a prestigious platform to a blatantly pro-abortion politician. In fact, it's irresponsible. During his presidential campaign, we covered the former mayor's abortion extremism extensively on this show. Both his platform and record are clear. Notre Dame has a responsibility to educate their students on the Catholic Church's teachings on life, and I imagine that will be difficult when Buttigieg's record gravely contradicts it. Notre Dame is named after Our Lady, Our Holy Mother. And so I pray Our Lady helps Buttigieg to open his eyes to the dignity of life at all stages. Foster care and adoption are crucial parts of the pro-life movement's fabric. Not only do we want mothers in unexpected pregnancies to know that adoption is an option, but we also care for the safety and well-being of the very children placed for adoption or living in foster care. For this week's Pro-Life Focus, we're spotlighting a new executive order addressing this important matter. President Donald Trump signed an executive order last week to bolster the federal government's work with community and faith-based groups in adoption and foster care. According to the Department of Health and Human Services, the order will encourage better partnerships between states and faith-based and community groups in adoption and foster care, will help to publicize best practices and help states and local authorities recruit more foster care and adoptive families. There are currently around 430,000 children in the foster care system, according to HHS, and nearly 20,000 children age out of the system each year without having been adopted. EW Chan News Nightly's White House correspondent Owen Jensen spoke with a Catholic HHS official last week to hear more on why the faith-based group component is so important. 
It has been exciting to meet with faith-based groups who are reaching out to congregations and to people that they know to help find that forever parent. Oftentimes, the Child Protection Service looks within their own silos of contacts to find parents who want to adopt. By having faith-based assistance, we are finding churches who will find adoptive parents who want to love these kids, and then the church will wrap around those children to keep them healthy and ensure they thrive. Well, that does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Until next week, we'd love to hear from you. Find us on social media at EWTN Pro-Life on all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're there. And if you prefer email, you can always send us a message by emailing prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. we love to hear from you. And remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.